Well, hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Monica Powell. I'm the Senior Associate Dean and Graduate Dean here at the Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. And I am delighted that you are considering UT Dallas as your destination for graduate degree. We have got a great team of folks who are joining us for this particular uh, webinar. And I wanna tell you a little bit about these folks. We have Karina Cantua. She is our Director of our Advising Operation here in the school. She has been here a long time. She knows every answer to every question I have ever asked her. And she is the number one go-to person when we have webinars like this to answer really critical application questions for prospective students. We also have this wonderful entourage of folks that come to us from our International Students and Scholars Office. These people have the patience of I don't even know who, but they are able to handle a, a, a complete proliferate of questions that international students ask about coming to UT Dallas. We are so fortunate that in our graduate programs, we have fully employed students who come to us directly from work to engage in our master's and MBA programs. And then we have the great pleasure of having students from all over the world who choose UT Dallas as their destination for a graduate degree. And you can see along the bottom, uh, Josephine Vita, the director of the ISSO office. You can see Elizabeth Walker, an associate director, and also Sarah Koo. And these individuals are gonna help answer really critical questions that you have as a potential incoming F1 student. So let's look at what we're gonna cover today because we know that you have oodles of great questions and they tend to fall into one of these five bucket categories. And we know that for you, it's really important that you get precise answers. So we're gonna address questions that we know students have asked a thousand times around applications and how do you fill them out and, um, and how do you respond and how does it work? So we're gonna address that. We're gonna look at scholarship questions. We know that going to graduate school is really important and we wanna make sure that you understand how to take advantage of those financial opportunities. We're gonna look at specific program questions, kind of what are the differences between the masters in terms of program length and credit hours and the MBA, which is a lot longer. And then of course, we're gonna address our wonderful guests from around the world who are considering UT Dallas as their destination. And we're gonna answer those all important uh, questions that you might have around F1 status and how we help all of our international students. And then of course, all of you that are attending are the stars of our show. And we wanna make sure that you don't leave here today without answers to your unique and specific questions. So we're gonna cover all of that and we're gonna start at the beginning with those all important application questions. So Karina, why don't you take it away and answer these questions? So absolutely, Dr. Powell, I'm happy to be here to answer all the application um, questions we can. I know we're gonna start with some of the more popular ones that Norma's gonna Go ahead and ask and I'll fill in the answers as best we can. Um, our first question is, what is the application deadline and what is the difference between the early and regular application deadline? Yes, so on the screen, you're gonna see the regular application deadlines. And when a student applies by those deadlines, they're applying on time with no late fees. That's a perfectly fine deadline to follow. Now, if you see the link on that screen, if you were to follow that, it takes you to the main university's page. And on that page, you will find some additional deadlines that are labeled the early application deadlines. If you're ready to go, if everything is good to go, an applicant has all of their documents ready and they want to follow the early application deadlines, they're more than welcome to do so. Um, the advantage of doing that is that you're going to get a decision earlier, right? If you submit an application early, then you're going to get an earlier decision. But please do not be discouraged. If you happen to miss that early application deadline, it, it's okay. We're still reviewing application after that deadline. We'll still get you a decision as quickly as possible. So it's okay if you miss the early application deadline and you're just following the regular application deadline. Our second question is, do you offer GMAT and GRE waivers? And how do you apply for a GMAT or GRE waiver? Certainly. Yes, we actually do offer GMAT GRE waivers and it's actually pretty simple when you apply uh, and you submit all of your application materials except for the GMAT GRE. We're actually going to send your application file over to the review committee and they're going to determine whether or not a GMAT GRE waiver is possible. 
If it's possible, we're going to continue processing your application and you're going to get a final decision that's going to be official. You're good to go. Now, if the waiver is not possible, we're actually going to notify you of that, let you know that you did not actually qualify for the GMAT GRE waiver, uh, and we're going to expect a GMAT GRE score in order to continue with the review of the application. Um, I do want to note on here that Dr. Powell is going to touch on scholarships in a little bit, and if you're interested in that, you have to be mindful that an, a GMAT GRE score is required for, for that. Do I need to submit official transcripts and test scores with my admissions application? So the answer to that is no. Uh, for an application review, we can actually use unofficial documents. Uh, you only need to submit official documents after you're admitted and in preparation for registration in your first semester. We do need to have official documents for you to remain enrolled in your first semester's um, coursework. But for the review of the application, we can work with unofficial documents. Um, I do have that little uh, reminder, like in my previous answer, Dr. Powell is going to talk about scholarships and you have to be mindful about that because you do need an official GMAT GRE uh, for that scholarship consideration. Now, if you're not interested in scholarships, then you're more than welcome um, to just work with unofficial documents, period. Do you offer a waiver for the English proficiency requirement? Yes, we actually do. Um, this is another item that's going to be reviewed automatically. Um, as you see on that left hand side of the screen, um, you're not required to submit an English proficiency exam if either one, your native country's primary language is English, or number two, if you earned a degree previously um, through instruction and examination in English. So either of those two scenarios, the English uh, proficiency exam is going to be waived. Again, it's going to happen automatically, but we do have to have an, uh, a complete application in order to do the review for that um, English proficiency as well. Can I apply to more than one program? Yes, yes, um, you can. Um, the application system actually allows you to submit multiple applications for the same or even different semesters. Um, and it's going to automatically share information across those applications. So once you enter your biographical information or information on your educational background, uh, this information is going to carry over the other applications uh, for any of the graduate programs you apply to at UTD. So you don't have to resubmit that type of information again. Uh, so that makes it pretty, pretty uh, simple process if you are interested in applying to more than one program. Our next question is, how long does it take to receive an admission decision after applying? OK, so once we have all of your application uh, materials that are needed for review, so if you got a GMAT GRE waivers, everything except that. Uh, if you didn't, we need a GMAT GRE. So once everything is submitted, it's going to take us about two weeks to get it through the process, get it to review committee, get a final decision to be able to give you that final um, decision on the application. So our goal is al always two weeks. Uh, we do encounter some periods of time where there's a high influx of applications and a lot more that we're working in, with. Uh, but even within that, we are still pushing. We're still trying to get you a decision as quickly as possible to meet that, uh, that goal of getting you a, a reply in two weeks. Our next question is quite common. Um, what is the profile of our average admitted student? Sure, OK, yeah, so this is going to depend on the program um, that you're looking into. Um, so I would encourage students to visit our program pages that are on our School of Management website. And there you can take a look at the class profile for each of the programs that um, a student is interested in. They were, they're they going to look like what is on the screen right now. It's going to have a lot of um, good information, a good snapshot of what each program and how you as an applicant compare to that average admitted student. Thank you so much, Karina. We are going to go back to Dr. Powell so that we can talk about scholarship questions. You're welcome. So our first scholarship question, Dr. Powell, is what types of scholarship are available as a new student and as a continuing student? Wow, that's a great and very popular question, Norma. I think the first thing that I would tell every prospective student is to go and thoroughly read the scholarship web page. Every single possible question that you can answer ask is answered on that page. So take time to plow through some of that information. It will save you the anxiety of trying to get a specific answer when those answers are readily available. Um, th so there are two types of scholarships for students. 
Generally, incoming brand new student scholarships that we call the Dean's Excellence Award, those are awarded in the fall and the spring, with the bulk of them being given in the fall semester, uh, but they're given to incoming new graduate students. Please notice on our website that there are certain categories of students that aren't eligible to apply for those new incoming because many of those scholarship programs have their own or many of those degree programs have their own scholarships. So please be mindful of that um, on the website. So you have new Dean's Excellence Awards for new students, and you also have continuing student awards. Those only occur in the fall semester. So if a student starts with us one fall, they might be awarded an incoming new student scholarship, but the next year they would need to apply for a continuing student scholarship. The bulk of our scholarships award for only two consecutive semesters, and many of them will have an in-state tuition waiver. Our next question is incredibly important as it has to do with the deadline. What is the deadline to apply for scholarship? So the deadlines always stay the same. They never move. So for the spring semester, if you're going to be a new student in the spring, it's December 1. If you're going to be a new student in the fall, you need to apply by May 1. Uh, the May 1 deadline is also the same deadline for continuing students as well. So you really want to hold tight. If you apply on May 2nd, you will not be considered. So hold tight to those deadlines and make sure you apply on time. Our next question has to do with something that Karina mentioned earlier involving the GMAT and GRE. Am I eligible to apply for a scholarship if my GMAT and G or GRE was waived? Great, great question. So here is the answer. An official GMAT or GRE score must be submitted to be considered for a scholarship. So if you were admitted on a waiver of the GMAT or GRE, you can apply for a scholarship, but you are not going to be considered. There must be an official score in our system for the scholarship committee to consider an award. And you also need to be admitted. So a prospective applicant cannot be considered until they've been admitted to the Jindal School. What does the scholarship committee look for when they're awarding scholarship? So just like our application process uh, is holistic, so is our scholarship committee process. Um, and, and so let me explain what that means. From an admissions perspective, we look at everything that you submit. We look at your undergraduate transcripts. We look at graduate transcripts if you happen to have already gotten a graduate degree. We look at your essays, your letters of recommendation, your resume, your narrative or statement of purpose. So all of that is evaluated in an admission decision. It is also re-evaluated along with a GMAT or GRE score for a scholarship award. So it is a holistic process looking at everything. So you want to do a really good job in the applying process so that what moves on to the scholarship committee is also really good. But don't forget, you need to submit an official GMAT or GRE score. When will I find out if I was awarded a scholarship? So generally speaking, um, we have a rolling process for making scholarship awards, which to some students means we make that in a series of batches, but it depends upon the time of the year. In the fall, when we're making uh, decisions about scholarship for spring, we wait till really late in the fall and we don't make a bunch of batch decisions. If it is uh, uh, somebody who's applying, and that's for people that are going into spring, if you're applying for a scholarship in the fall, we generally start making awards in late February and we'll continue to make on a rolling uh, basis until the committee basically runs out of money to award. Now, it is always to your advantage to apply early um, because, you know, early bird gets the worm uh, and you want to be considered as soon as possible. But generally speaking, um, we don't make awards for spring until really late in the fall, and we don't make uh, awards in the fall. Um, we, we make those just periodically throughout the spring. Am I eligible for in-state tuition if I am awarded scholarship? So a great many of our scholarships include an in-state tuition waiver, meaning you, that your tuition would uh, uh, just basically go in partnership with what an in-state student at the state of Texas would pay. So we're converting an out-of-state rate to an in-state rate or an out-of-residency rate to an in-state rate. 
basically that means you save about half of the tuition. But remember, scholarships are awarded for two consecutive semesters. So that means um, a tuition waiver for fall, followed by a tuition waiver for spring. If you're awarded a, a spring scholarship, then that is a tuition waiver for spring and a tuition waiver for summer. Not every award has a tuition waiver, but you would know it by the award letter in which you receive. Our next section has to do with um, some very common program questions that we receive. Um, the first one being, how many credit hours does the program take to complete? So that is a really great question. And the example on the screen is specifically about a master's degree program. And the example is a business analytics degree. So all of our master's degree programs here in the Gendal School are 36 credit hours, but you will enroll in 37 because you are required to take a program prerequisite in your first semester here. And that program prerequisite is professional development, MAS 6102. It's a one credit hour class that we require of all of our students coming in. So an individual um, in getting obtaining a master's degree is gonna take 36 plus one, 37 credit hours in order to graduate. But if you're coming into an MBA degree, that is a 53 credit hour program. So that's going to take longer um, to complete. And uh, there are not any program prerequisites for the MBA. So you can come in um, and you're, of course, also able to transfer in credit hours. Uh, the master's transfers in nine, the MBA you can transfer in 12, but you have to go through a review process uh, for any of those courses to potentially uh, uh, transfer. Now, keep in mind that as you're looking at which graduate program to apply to, you need to visit that program webpage because on that program webpage, we are going to break that curriculum down for you. We're going to break down what is core class requirements for that master's or MBA, and we're going to break down what the electives are and whether or not that master's and MBA have potential concentrations that you can choose. So this is the kind of thing that you want to study early. You don't want to come in and make a decision at the last moment if you're going to go into the supply chain program. You want to have studied the potential concentrations in the supply chain program based upon the kind of job you want to get when you graduate. So you want to spend ample time on our program web pages, whether or not it's an MS or whether it's the MBA. Go and click on what will take you to the curriculum. Look at the core classes that are required, then look at the concentrations you can take and the elective options you have in each concentration and base that upon what it is you want to do when you've completed the degree. You want to graduate with the knowledge that will make you qualified for that position that you're applying for. You don't want to waste any of those precious semesters taking classes that really aren't going to be relevant to the career that you're looking for post completion of the degree. Our next question is what is the estimated cost for the entire program? So that is a complicated question, Norma, uh, and I'm going to do my best to try and answer that. So we're at a university where the more credit hours you take in a semester, the less you pay per credit hour. Now, keep in mind that full time graduate work is nine credit hours. When you're an undergraduate, full time is 12 or 14 or 15, depending upon what university you go to. But typically, nine credit hours is full time coursework. So you don't want to come in here and think, oh, well, Dr. Powell said the more credit hours I take, the less cost per credit hour. So I'm going to complete it in two long semesters and take 18 credit hours my first semester. No, that is not a good decision because taking 18 credit hours of graduate class will kill you. Um, so what you want to do is think about how you're going to go through the program and how many hours you're going to take each semester. Now there's a handy dandy cost of attendance um, calculator that you can get to and you can see how to get there by the link on the screen. You can put in that you're graduate, you can put in that you're out of state or in state, you can put in what school you're going to and the number of credit hours and it will give you an estimate of your tuition. But keep in mind that, you know, there's tuition, there's supplemental tuition uh, expenses, and then we also have 
uh, additional fees for things like uh, online classes that you will take, um, like synchronous and asynchronous classes. So those have fees. So this is just an estimate, but it's a good good way to help you think about what the approximate cost will be as you move through either a 36 credit hour master's degree or 53 credit hour MBA. Our next question is, who should I contact if I have questions about the degree curriculum or career outlook for the program I am interested in? So I, I really love this question. And the most important part of the answer to this question is bringing up the program director. As a prospect to a graduate degree program here at the Jindal School, you have probably already received emails from your designated program director. They are absolutely the best resource for you to contact um, or even attend their webinars. They have specific webinars about business analytics and supply chain and healthcare and innovation and entrepreneurship and MBA, where you can, you can hear them talk about, here are the core courses, here's what we cover, here are the concentrations, here are the kind of jobs that you can get, here's what the class profile looks uh, like. And that program director is your point of contact for the entire time that you're here in the program. So they can help you with everything from choosing your elective courses to your concentration to, oh my gosh, I'm really struggling in this class. You know, what do I do? Um, they can talk to you about careers and career options. They are your first line of defense in answering all of those kinds of questions. And you see those examples on the right side of your screen. If you look to the left side of your screen, you'll see the great thing that Karina and her team can do for you. We have a great advising operation, a whole team of experts that help students with more about the mechanics of being a student. You know, understanding a degree plan. What are the courses that are required? How do you register for classes? How do you add? How do you drop? How do you uh, change your degree program? How do you apply for graduation? So that's what the advising office does. But as a prospective student, whether it's an MS or an MBA, you will want to reach out to those program directors. Most of our program directors hold weekly or bi-weekly webinars where they can answer tons of information, uh, questions about um, you know, the degree plan and, and what the careers are. And oftentimes they will bring current students and alumni to those webinar sessions to really help prospective students understand and appreciate the return on the investment in coming to the Jindal School. What type of career support does JSOM offer? So I love this slide. I, I just love this graphic because I think that this is really um, there are a couple of things that really distinguish the Jendal School from other schools that you might be looking at and considering. And so one of those distinguishing uh, differences is around our career management support. We have our own dedicated career management team here in the Jendal School called the CMC, the Career Management Center, um, and they do all of the things that you see on the screen. But we make it even easier than just walking into a center and saying, please help me with an internship or please help me with networking. We require all of our master's students to take a professional development class where in your very first semester, we get your resume ready for distribution, organized in the way that our employers expect to see your resume. We have already taught you how to network. We have already uh, introduced you to the process for securing an internship. We have already walked you specifically through how to frame your cover letter, how to, how to connect with uh, the career management folks and attend workshops and career fairs and employer engagements. So that's one resource within the school. The other resource within the school around career is your actual program. You will see that your program directors are holding events where they are bringing in awesome panels of alumni who will talk about how they landed their internship or how they landed their H-1B job or their full-time position um, and will share with prospective students and current students how they made it happen and how they can uh, make it happen as well. So that's one distinguishing feature about the Jindal School that is really different than all of the other graduate business schools in America. The other side of career is around our student organizations. We have over 70 student organizations here. And really the bulk of those organizations are focused exclusively on 
helping a student understand the career that they're going into and networking with employers and alumni and people that can help them advance uh, their career goals. And they help host case competitions and employer uh, competitions so that we can give students the best advantage. There isn't a graduate school in America that has 70 plus student organizations to help students on the career side. So keep in mind those two distinguishing features, but all of the resources that you see on the screen, they're here and, and ready for you to take advantage of as a student uh, at UT Dallas. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Um, now we are going to go over to Elizabeth Walker, who will be answering some of our questions that have to do with international student considerations. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's exciting to have you here as prospective UT Dallas students. Our first question that we get a lot from our eager students is how do I contact ISSO? Um, that is a great question. We have many different ways for students to receive advising services through the ISSO. We have something called live chat where you can type your answer and get a, an immediate response from an advisor. Um, <clears throat> if you need more time to ask your questions, you can schedule a, a virtual appointment through Microsoft Teams. We do offer face-to-face -face appointments also if you happen to be in the area. And we have something called Ask an Advisor through iComet, where you can submit a uh, question and get a response from an advisor in a day or two. Our next question is, what is the iComet portal that you just mentioned? So once a student has been admitted to UT Dallas, they have access to iComet. And iComet is where you would submit your request for an I-20 if you are an international student. Um, you would log into iComet to upload the required documents for an I-20, which would be the financial affidavit form, passport, um, and proof of financial support. We have a lot of students who are very eager to get started on the I-20 process after after they're admitted. So how do they apply for their I-20? So to become, an, to become an F1 student, the student needs to apply for the I-20 and then apply for an F1 visa. Um, first, they need to be admitted to a degree seeking program at UT Dallas and then um, submit to the ISSO through iComet a copy of their passport, which is valid for at least six months into the future. Um, a copy of the UT Dallas financial affidavit completed by the student and sufficient funding. And if you're not sure what is sufficient funding, you may visit our website, which talks about the financial requirements and the type of acceptable financial documents. These next questions have to do with the visa. So the first one is, how do I prepare for a visa appointment? So preparing for the F-1 visa appointment is really important. Um, first, you need the required documents to apply for the visa, which would be the valid passport, the, the initial I-20, the proof of financial support, the proof of admission to UT Dallas, and very importantly, your proof of ties to your home country. What are some common mistakes or missteps that international students sometimes make when they're applying for their I-20 or when they have their visa appointment? So when applying for their I-20, students sometimes submit financial documents that were issued uh, more than 12 months in the past or in uh, that are not in English or um, that are financial documents that we are not able to accept. Um, so if a student is unsure of what type of financial documents we can accept, always referring to our website is great. Um, for the visa appointment, um, so when the student has their visa appointment, the visa officer wants to know about their intent. Um, their intent should be to come to UT Dallas and to get a degree in a field that is going to tie directly back to their career goals in their home country. Um, if the student indicates that their goals are to have a career in the U.S. after they get their degree here, um, they may not be granted the F-1 visa because the F-1 visa is a non-immigrant visa. And what advice do you have for somebody whose visa is denied? So if a student's F-1 visa is unfortunately denied, the visa officer should give them a slip of paper that indicates the exact reason for their denial, okay? 
um, the student can then schedule a subsequent visa appointment with the understanding that they have to have some new information for the visa officer to consider, either something that they say or something that they present. Um, because if they present exactly what they did the previous time, they'll get the same decision. Our next question has to do with on-campus employment. Um, as an international student, and am I, am I eligible for on-campus jobs? Yes, uh, F1 students, once they've got their visa and their I-20, can enter the United States up to 30 days before their semester start date, their program start date at UT Dallas, and can work on campus up to 30 days before the semester start date. Um, F1 students can work in any job on campus that provides direct services to students, and they don't need any special authorization from the ISSO. They are allowed to work up to 20 hours per week during a long semester and full time during school breaks. When will I be eligible for CPT? So lots of F1 students are interested in CPT. This is off campus paid internships related to a student's major. Um, students are eligible for CPT after they have completed um, an academic year in F1 status, which would be two long semesters. They also have to be in good academic standing and meet all requirements of the JSON Career Management Center prior to being eligible for approval from the ISSO. Thank you so much, Karina. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of additional questions here um, that we're going to answer that the students have in addition to what we have covered. Um, we are a very student centered um, kind of school and university, and we care very much about your questions and we give you a lot of venues in which to ask them. So those program directors, which you've seen emails from, they are a great resource. Um, you can always e email gendal at utdallas.edu if there are questions that we don't answer here today. Um, and we have something called the JSOM question desk, and you can see a link on your screen, and they can also answer questions. But I encourage all of you to be really proactive. Um, you know, you have to do a lot of planning if you're going to come to graduate school. So take the time to read websites. Take the time to read important emails. Take time to read the application process. Really, most of the answers that you need are readily available on the website. So take a quick look there. Um, just do us a favor and don't email the same question to about 20 people. That will make it a little bit challenging for you when you get all of those same answers back in your email box. Um, so I guess, Norma, you know, um, let's move on to, to questions that students might have and let's, let's see what they've come up with that we didn't think about in advance. Alrighty, Dr. Powell, um, we do have some questions and the first one has to do with curriculum. Um, you mentioned earlier about our master's program specifically being 36 credit hours in length and some of our attendees have looked at the curriculum online and noticed an MAS 6102 course, a professional development course. Does that, is that part of the 36 credit hours or could you talk a little bit more about that course and its purpose? Sure thing, Norma, and yes, thank you for being so observant. We talked about this particular class when we were talking about the career services provided to our students earlier in this webinar. And yes, every incoming master's student is required to take MAS 6102 Professional Development. It is the 37th credit hour that you will take while you are here. You take it in your very first semester. It must be completed in the first 12 credit hours, and it is the course that will help help you get ready to um, apply for internships and jobs. It will help you understand how networking is really critical here in the US and how you engage through our student organizations to engage with employers and alumni. So um, yes, if you are going to complete the um, master's program, the degree itself is 36 credit hours plus one program prerequisite hour of MAS 6102. We have a, a couple attendees who have mentioned that they were admitted to, to our programs already, so congratulations to them. But a couple have mentioned that, let's say, for example, they were admitted into the Business Analytics Flex, but they're a little bit more interested in the cohort instead. Can they switch programs prior to starting um, or do they need to wait till after they're here? Wow, that is a great question and thank you for the person that asked that. So let me just talk for a moment about the difference between 
the business analytics cohort and the business analytics flex program because there are unique differences. The cohort program is smaller. You go through that as a group of individuals all together. You're generally taking all of your courses together as a group, which builds great camaraderie and a great kind of cohort experience. Um, and you have a couple of concentrations that you can choose from when you're in the cohort program. The flex program is a bigger program. Um, it has many more options in terms of what you can uh, choose in terms of your concentrations and you don't take all of your classes with the same individuals it just mixes up every time you sign up for a semester so if you've been admitted to both of those programs you will need to select the one that you're planning to come in now it may mean that you've accepted your admission in both but you intend only to enroll in one of them. And so let's say that you enroll in the flex program, but you decide, wow, I really want to be in the cohort program. You need to complete the first semester and near the end of the first semester, you can um, talk with the advising office about the eligibility in, a, in getting into the other program and then process a program change form if you meet the criteria in order to make that move. There are some things that will keep you from making that move, Academic performance is one of those, so you just want to wait until after the first um, near the end of the first semester to make that transition. Thank you. Our next question has to do with our course formats for uh, this upcoming semester and for fall. Um, what are the course formats that we that we offer um, now that we're kind of post pandemic? Man, am I so glad we are post pandemic. So we typically have three. Um, we have face to face classes, which is you in a classroom with the instructor and all of your classmates, and that's a face to face class. And when you go into the registration system, you'll see that as a face to face class. We also have something called asynchronous. That is a fully online class that is not live. That means it doesn't have a date and time in which it meets, but it does follow a semester schedule and has weekly assignments and tests that are on a certain schedule. So it's not like a uh, independent study, self-study class where you can just wait until the last two weeks and then do the whole class in two weeks. You follow a semester a schedule. A class like that will have a section number with a W in it. So it might be Finance 6301, Fin 6301, OW1. If there is a W in that section number, that is an asynchronous class. Now we also have another kind of class that is an online class and it is a, a synchronous class. We don't have very many of those on the schedule for this coming spring, but you will start to see more and more of those. A synchronous class also has a W in it. Both of those uh, distance learning classes also have an additional fee, but the synchronous class meets on a specific date and time. So that means you are expected to be in that class with that professor and your classmates with your camera on, for that asynchronous class that happens. There are a handful of hybrid classes uh, on the schedule, but they're very few and far between. And that's really basically uh, hybrid means you're in class one week, you're online the next, in class one week, online the next. But we have very, very, very few hybrid classes. So really it comes down to three modalities, face-to-face, -face, asynchronous or fully online, and then the synchronous, which is meeting on a specific date and time and your camera is on live. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and bring um, Elizabeth Walker onto the screen uh, because we have a couple students who have asked when visa uh, visa slots will open for spring 2023. And I was wondering if you could also answer that question for those that are online that are interested in fall 2023. Thank you, Norma. Um, so in general, um, the as you know the spring program start date is going to be january 17 2023 and the fall start date is going to be august 21st 2023 um, students should be able to apply for a visa up to four months before that program start date however actual visa avail appointment availability really depends on the u.s consulate and embassy where you are applying so i would recommend reaching out th to them directly um, what we experienced in the fall is that at least in india um, first time visa appointments were being prioritized. Students who were denied a visa and had to apply for a second visa um, were being given a slot very close to the program start date. 
And while I have you on the screen, could you tell our attendees, because I saw a question here about the enrollment requirements. Dr. Powell was talking about our course formats. And so we have a couple of students wondering how many face-to-face -face classes they have to be enrolled in, how many courses they have to be enrolled in um, to be in compliance. Okay, so um, graduate international students must be enrolled in at least nine credit hours each long semester. Um, starting in spring 2023, uh, we are going back to the U.S. government's pre-COVID requirement that of the nine credit hours that you are required to take each semester, only three of those hours can be online. Wow, that's big news, Elizabeth. So would you mind saying yes. that again? Because I think that's yes. going to be a really important message yes. that we need to get out to anybody who is starting in the spring. Absolutely. So. Pre-COVID, um, the U.S. government's requirement was, and will be again this spring, that of your nine credit hours, only three can be online. So you must be prepared to attend the other six credit hours face-to-face. -face. Um, during COVID, many students were able to take everything online, but that um, <clears throat> is no longer going to be the case. Wow, well, thank you for that important update. We'll have to get that message out to all of our international students. For sure. And while I have Elizabeth still on the screen, I have one more question for you. Um, how many days does it take to receive your I-20 after requesting it? It takes about three to five business days. Um, a student will need to submit a copy of their passport, the UTD financial affidavit, and proof of financial support. Once we have all the required documents, about three to five business days, the I-20 will be sent to you electronically, and you will be able to download that, sign it, and take it to your visa interview. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I'll bring Dr. Powell back to the screen. And earlier we were talking about, you know, the possibility of changing programs and we use the words cohort and flex. And we have somebody who's asked if you could talk a little bit more about the difference between cohort and flex, um, what that means. Oh, that's a great question. So if you look in the Merriam-Webster dictionary for the definition of cohort, it basically means group. So if you are going into a cohort program, you are doing it as a group of people and you generally are following the same path. So that has a lot of great advantages, has a little bit of a smaller feeling to it. You get to know that group of students really, really well as you uh, traverse through your uh, degree program. Um, and so it's it's a little bit more of a more intimate experience because it, it, it feels smaller. If you are in a flex program, flex, which of course stands for flexibility, means that you have a lot more discretion in terms of the classes that you take, the order in which you take them, and you are not taking them with the same group of students. Every class will have a different set of students that are in that room with you. And the really cool thing about our um, our flex programs here in the Gendal School, a lot of our master's degrees are flexible in that uh, in that context is that you meet students from all across the other degree programs. You might be sitting in a class with a finance student who's chosen to take that elective. You might be in the class with an MBA student. You might be in the class with a supply chain student, an analytics student, an ITM student, a healthcare student, an innovation and entrepreneurship student, an international management studies student. And so there's a, a lot more degree diversity in the classroom when you're taking a flex, uh, a flex program. So that's really the difference between the two. Thank you. Um, our next question has to do with a prerequisite. Um, somebody noticed on the website OPRE 6303, Quantitative Foundations of Business, which is a prerequisite. Um, so they're wondering, you know, if they have to take it, is it considered part of the 36, 36 credit hours? Oh, what a great, great question. So the answer is that if you are required to take it, you will know it in your admission letter. It will say that you have to take that class. And that's probably because um, the admissions committee is seeing a deficiency that they want to make sure that you can handle the courses that will come and they want to make sure that you can tackle it. So they're going to require 6303. That does not count amongst your 36 degree credit hours. That would be an additional course that you have to take. We have a few of our attendees who are interested in teaching assistantships. Could you talk a little bit more about that and when they might be eligible to be a teaching assistant? 
Sure, so you are not eligible to be a teaching assistant your first semester. You generally complete the first semester. Um, you can apply. We have a, a, a place where you can go and apply and it's it's actually now going to be an e learning course that you go through to go through the qualifying process and then move to the second process, which is actually applying. But generally faculty are looking for really strong performing students who have done well in the classes for which they will be a teaching assistant. Um, and, and it isn't all just about the grade necessarily. So you might have somebody who has an overall GPA of a 3.7 that is awarded a teaching assistantship, but they may have seven years of experience in a very specific set of courses and made A's in those courses, which would make them the best qualified candidate to uh, be a teaching assistant. You know, sometimes students think that um, they get confused. I made a 4.0. Why didn't I get a teaching assistantship? Well, the faculty are looking for the best qualified. So some of those teaching assistantships go to the perfect grade performers, and some of them go to individuals who have significant prior work experience plus good grades in certain courses. Next question has to do with um, enrollment and also um, internships. Um, what is the typical um, enrollment for an international student in terms of credit hours that they take per semester and how long they take to finish? And when do they typically start doing internships? Oh, such a great question. So you heard Elizabeth a minute ago talk about a long semester. That is just a funny term. A long semester at UT Dallas means a fall semester or a spring semester, where both of those semesters are 16 weeks in length. And the shorter compressed summer semester is much shorter. It can be 12, 13 weeks in length. So it's a very much a compressed semester. So as an international student, you are required to be enrolled in a minimum of nine credit hours in long semesters or fall and spring. You are not required to be enrolled in the summer unless the summer is your very first semester. Um, so please um, keep that in mind. And in terms of internship and the requirements you have to complete to get there, um, there's quite a number of them. Uh, you have to have a 3.0 overall GPA, so you have to make sure you've reached that hurdle. And you must have completed two long semesters. So if you start in the spring, this next spring, you will need to go spring, all of spring, May or may not take classes in the summer, that's up to you. And then all of fall, your first semester, you would be eligible for internship would be spring of 2024. And if we have um, students who are entering in fall of 2023? So then you would be eligible in summer of 2024 because you will have taken fall, which is a long semester, spring, which is a long semester, and then you would be eligible in summer of 2024 for that internship. Perfect. Um, we have some students who, you know, know other students who were here during the pandemic and a lot of um, career services were virtual. Are we offering in-person, you know, career fairs and in-person career activities uh, now? Yeah, we are. I mean, we have the the traditional career fairs that the university has, or expos we often call them. We also have a lot of career engagements that happen within your degree program as well, which are happening face to face. But I will tell you that in the United States, employers and recruiters in particular have found a big advantage that came from the pandemic. They really enjoy recruiting students virtually as well because they can go to so many more campuses. So don't be surprised if some of those opportunities to engage with employers are actually done virtually. The other thing that has changed as a result of the pandemic is that, you know, employers used to come and do the face to face interviews with students. Now they do multiple rounds of interviews with students and they tend to do the first and perhaps the second round they conduct virtually and because it saves saves that employer a lot of money in terms of travel and hotel and time. So that's one of the big takeaways from the pandemic that has really benefited students and especially students who go to a really big school like ours because employers like to come to big schools. They like to engage with schools that can offer them a wide array of potential candidates for their positions. The next question has to do with double degrees. Uh, we have a couple people who mentioned possibly doing a double degree, an MBA and an MS. What would that mean in terms of additional credit hours and time? About how much longer would that add? 
Well, um, that's a. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question, Norma, whoever asked that question, and I'm going to also bring Karina in in just a second to kind of help a little bit uh, because it's it. There's not as simple an answer to the question, but I first want to start with how long is the typical master student here in our program? Typically, our students are here 21 months. Almost all of our internationals come for 20. 21 months. They they typically do four long semesters and the reason that they do that is they want to take advantage of as much internship as they can. And if they do that and they do the two long semesters, so let's say you come in in fall of 23. That's fall of 23, spring of 24. In summer of 24, you're eligible for your first internship, but then oftentimes they'll get another internship in fall of 24 and then do a final internship in spring of 25. So that's why students want to come and stay for the 21 months or the four long semesters in one summer because they want to take advantage of obtaining that opportunity to land uh, you know, a great uh, H-1B position here in the US or a, a great uh, general position if you're not an international student. So, um, so that's the amount of time. Now, if you are going to do the, the combo degree, the MS MBA degree, it depends upon the combination of the MS with the MBA. The minimum number that it could be is 63. So think about it like this. The MS program is 36, the MBA is 53. If you put them together, you're able to share some of the courses toward both the degrees. So that means you have to take fewer degrees. So the minimum number if you get both is 63 credit hours. Now, again, it depends upon which MS you're combining it with. If you're combining it with an MS in finance, that can be a problem. I'm going to turn that over to Karina in just a second. But generally speaking, our students, MS students who decide to add in that MBA, um, they still finish it in the in the 24 months because they're just adding a, a few courses here and there. So, Karina, you want to jump in and talk a little bit more specifically about that combination? Sure. So, um, basically, so what we'll do is we will always try to get you um, both degrees with the minimum requirements as possible, but we do have to abide by the degree requirements in the catalog. So, if you want to kind of just explore what that would look like, if you take uh, your first, your two combination, the two programs that you want to combine and just look at how much overlap there is. You can kind of cross those off or check those off so you can see. And then one of the things you'll notice is depending on that, uh, the programs that you're looking at, some of the programs do not have a lot of overlap. So those would be the ones where the credit hours that are required are going to be a little bit more than the minimum uh, where we'll keep you. Uh, but of course, if you want to just send us a, a quick question, we can kind of take a, a look at what you're trying to combine uh, and, and give you a little bit of information on how that would work. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody, for um, answering all those questions. It looks like that's all the time we have for questions. I want to just let everybody know we will be sharing the recording and PowerPoint. And Dr. Powell, it is off to you for any closing remarks you'd like to share. Well, thank you so much, Norma. First of all, I really want to thank all of the students who've joined us, um, whom we hope will finish the application process, give us an opportunity to bring you into the Gendal School and give you a great uh, graduate degree experience. We would love to have you on board, love to get to meet you and get to know you. Secondly, I want to thank the great team that we have here. Uh, Norma, of course, is manning all the magical levers behind the screen to make these webinars happen. So thank you to Norma. And then, of course, uh, Karina, um, Elizabeth, other folks that are in the background like Josephine and Sarah, and then, of course, Angela Howard, who joins us to be able to answer a lot of those questions that come into the chat. Um, we hope that as you as you seriously look at where you're going to to land for your graduate degree experience, um, that it'll be UT Dallas. And we hope that you'll engage with us and ask us questions that you have. Give us an opportunity uh, to address those specifically. Again, you can always reach us by the emails that are on the screen. Um, JSOM GR advising at utdallas.edu or the JSOM question desk. Or if you can't remember those and you can't find the deck, you can always send an email to gendal at utdallas.edu. And we thank you for making time to be with us today. We hope to hear from you in the near future. Please reach out if we can answer any of your questions. So until next time, we'll see you soon. Bye.